Um, so this is very much a work in progress um, still. Um, and uh, I've just been trying to make sense of the fact of reason for some time. And I'll present you with some questions and some answers today. And then at the end, some further questions. Um, and I'm looking forward to your um, feedback. So um, I think the first thing to note is that um, the word fact of reason, of fact in various um, permutations, uh, occurs 11 times in the second critique, but it's not spread throughout the second critique. It occurs really only in the first chapter, in the principles chapter of the analytic. It doesn't occur in the second chapter on concepts, good and evil, nor in the third chapter about motivation, nor in the dialectic, nor in the doctrine of method, nor elsewhere in his works. And there are two um, references to the fact, uh, one in the preface and another one in the critical elucidation of the analytic, but they refer to the first chapter of the analytic. So really it's only in the first chapter. Uh, and I think that should just give us pause and we should ask why is it that Kant uses the word only very sporadically and very strategically, I think. Now also, um, and I have a long list of all the 11 um, passages um, and uh, translation and sort of various notes and so on and so forth. If you go through them, and they're sometimes quoted indiscriminately uh, by people, you see that they're not all equal. Uh, in fact, there's one core passage on which all other passages in various ways uh, rely to which um, all other passages uh, refer and is this. And now your pictures are obscuring um, some of the stuff I have to read out. Uh, which is a bit of a problem. Can I click you away or all oh, right, I can move you around. Okay, that's what that's what I'll do. Um, so this is it, uh, well known to everybody, but I'll read it again. Consciousness of this fundamental law can be called effective reason because it cannot be reasoned out from or ferreted out of um, antecedent data of reason, for example, from consciousness of freedom, for this is not given to us previously. And because it rather urges itself upon us by itself as an a priori synthetic proposition that is not founded on any intuition, either pure or empirical, even though it would be analytic if the freedom of the will were presupposed. But for this, as a positive concept, an intellectual intuition would be required, which cannot be assumed here at all. Yet in order to view this law as given without any misinterpretation, one must take good note that it is not an empirical fact, but the sole fact of pure reason, which thereby announces itself as originally legislative. And then you get a bit of Latin, which is a dig at Pistorius. Okay, I refer um, back to this passage uh, at various points during the talk. I just wanted to put it on the table because this is the core of the fact. Um, and first of all, um, question, in what sense? of the word is the fact of fact. And there's a long um, and distinguished discussion about this in the literature. Um, uh, I think the answer is fairly straightforward because Kant says in the passage just quoted, the fact is not an empirical fact, but the sole fact of pure reason. So it seems to me fairly clear that Kant is not using the word in the juridical sense of the word. Um, that is, it's not a deed, um, an imputable, act um, because there are no empirical deeds. Well, it wouldn't make sense to say that it's not an empirical fact um, if he were talking about um, facts in the juridical sense. The meaning of factum is tatsache. It's a matter of fact. So he's assimilating moral consciousness to an empirical fact, um, to something that's given. And he also uses the word data. It's not, of course, a fact given in outer experience, it's a fact kind of given in inner experience. It's something that we um, stumble across. It's something that we encounter <clears throat> in our, as you might call it in an extended sense of experience in our moral experience. Uh, there's a very telling definition of um, the word factum in the doctrine of right towards the end. So he says there, every factum, and then he glosses it in terms of tatsa, a matter of fact. So it does have this double meaning, but you have to decide which it is, is an object in appearance of the senses. 
Mary Gregor mistranslated this passage, by the way, because she thinks it's about deeds in the juridical sense, which it isn't. Um, so uh, the fact is that kind of fact, um, a given, um, only in a roundabout way. It is quasi-factual. And that explains, I think, why Kant is so cautious about calling the fact of reason a fact. It's sort of a fact, like an empirical fact, because it, you know, it's just a given. Uh, on the other hand, it, it can't really be an empirical fact because you wouldn't be able to do anything with an empirical fact in moral philosophy. That's why he says in the passage just read out, can be called, he doesn't say it is, he says it can be called. And later on, he often uses the rather enigmatic word gleichsam, as it were. Right, so he's, he's feeling a bit sort of squeamish about this, uh, but it's clear to me that he's saying it's something that we encounter in first person experience uh, when we judge morally. Moving on, um, next thing, uh, why does Kant call the fact a fact? The fact is a fact because, as he says, it cannot be reasoned out of um, from antecedent data of reason. Um, right, it's kind of a starting point. No argument can be given for its validity. In particular, it can't be established on the basis of freedom or of our being members of an intelligible world. Um, and in that sense, I think it's a brute fact. It's just there, um, end of story. Of course, he's referring to the third section of the groundwork here where he did in some not entirely uh, uh, obvious way, uh, try to derive, um, um, deduce, um, moral validity from our being members um, of an intelligible world. Uh, and I think he came to the conclusion that that uh, argument didn't work. And if you want to know why, uh, I can tell you during the discussion period. But equating the fact with an indemonstrable matter of fact is not to say that it doesn't point to the activity of pure reason. So a matter of fact can be the result of a deed and we have uh, some nice expressions for that. So I think this works quite well. So I'm not rejecting the, um, the Villaschek Fichte interpretation altogether, um, because we say in German Tatsachen schaffen, right? And as we say in English, uh, butchering the French language uh, as usual, uh, that we create a, a fait accompli. Um, so reason does something and the result uh, is a fact in the sense of a matter of fact. And also, as we see in a few minutes, a fact can serve as a starting point uh, in further arguments for the truth of other propositions. So I think so far, um, the fact is just um, a fact. And the main reason for calling the fact of reason a fact is that there's no argumentative root to um, moral consciousness, to the fact of reason in this sense. And this works extremely well if you um, take into account, and this has been done by other people, of course, by Pauline Kleingeld, uh, for example, and even by uh, people like Beck in the old days, uh, what he says about um, uh, moral consciousness in uh, the preface. Uh, and that's the quotation at the top of your screen. So he says, for if as pure reason, it is actually practical, reason is actually practical, it proves its reality and that of its concepts by what it does, or through the deed, durch die Tat. And all rationalizing against the possibility of its being practical is futile. Again, a, a dig at his own self a few years previously, uh, because there's a lot of rationalizing against uh, the moral law in uh, the second section of groundwork in particular. So reason proves its powers by creating a fact, by creating uh, a fait accompli. And at this point, as always, it's useful to consult uh, Adelung, uh, which is a contemporary uh, German dictionary, uh, and also uh, Kuttner and Nicholson, uh, which is uh, an early 19th century uh, German English dictionary based on Adelung, because and this is something we sort of lost sight of a bit, uh, partly because the German language has changed. But in the 18th century, um, the first and foremost meaning of Beweisen, uh, various translated demonstrate, prove or show, uh, was indeed proving something by action. Um, so there are two ways of doing this, two ways of demonstrating something. I think demonstrate works as truly well as a translation here. Uh, we can show something to be true by doing it, 
and you can show something to be true by proving it. Um, so here are a few examples. Um, Kuttner and Nicholson uh, use Adlung's examples as they usually do, and they just translate them. So they have, he has been very kind to me. He has acted kindly by me. Uh, and in Adlung, it says, viel Gutes bewiesen. Um, we might say erwiesen. Um, and uh, also he has given proof of his courage. Uh, and again, we would say that in just the same way, seine Tapferkeit bewiesen. So I'm suggesting that uh, the proof uh, at stake, the proof of pure reason is this kind of proof. Um, you show uh, that something can be done uh, by doing it. Uh, moral consciousness uh, is the result of uh, a deed of reason, but it's given to us as a given, as a fact of reason. Uh, the, the second sense uh, is just the well-known or uh, better known sense of uh, proving something uh, by means of um, argument. That's exactly what um, Kuttner, uh, Nicholson, uh, and Adelung say. Moving on uh, to uh, the role that the fact plays in the second critique. Uh, so again, it's uh, noteworthy that uh, um, the uh, occurrence of the word, the word isn't spread evenly throughout the second critique. I think you would expect, if it were just a blanket term for moral consciousness, you would expect it to uh, come up in uh, certainly the uh, motivation chapter, the third chapter of the analytic, and you would certainly expect it to come up in the doctrine of method. Um, uh, but uh, Kant doesn't use the word, uh, and you might have a, a boring uh, uh, kind of uh, historical uh, explanation. You say, oh, well, you know, he was done with the second critique, and then he changed his mind about the third section of groundwork, uh, and then he rewrote the first chapter, but not uh, anything else. Um, but I think that's kind of a measure of last resort, and we shouldn't say stuff like that uh, unnecessarily. Uh, so um, 11 times, all in the analytic, for all intents and purposes, um, and four, out of those 11 occurrences um, are in the deduction section. Uh, and there's another one in the closely related section that follows on the license of um, uh, going beyond uh, theoretical reason, basically. Um, and this suggests, and this is where I have to do more work, that uh, the fact uh, is not a, an all purpose term for moral consciousness, even though uh, we've been using uh, the word like that uh, for some time, and it was in evidence yesterday, uh, of course, as well. Um, partly because uh, the phenomenon is often described without reference to the word fact. Um, and, uh, you know, we can talk about an unconditional imperative, categorical imperative, dot, 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 without saying it's a fact of reason. And that the word points to a, a foundational architectonic role of the fact uh, within the project of the second critique. Um, and that's because it's on the basis of this fact, which itself doesn't um, admit of any further backup, that freedom is deduced. Hence the uh, title page of this PowerPoint presentation, a uh, well-known um, quotation from the preface of the second critique, uh, it's the keystone, freedom's the keystone of the entire edifice um, of a system of pure, even of speculative reason. It's the thing that you insert last, and then the system is stable um, and complete. Now, how robust is the fact of reason? And the answer is, and this is sort of, I'm now heading uh, in uh, the direction of Martin's uh, and Kate's talks uh, after quite a lot of stage setting. And the answer is that it's extremely robust. Um, this is uh, the uh, passage that follows immediately um, straight after the, uh, the long passage that I read at the beginning. Um, Kant says, the fact mentioned previously is undeniable, um, very strong word. Uh, one need only analyze the judgment that human beings pass on the lawfulness of their actions, and one will always find that whatever inclination may interject, their reason, incorruptible and constrained by itself, always holds the will's maxim in an action up to the pure will, i.e. to itself, by regarding itself as a priori practical. There may be overtones of uh, Andrea's talk uh, there um, as well. So 
What does that mean? Uh, is it plausible to say that the fact is undeniable? And I think it can't obviously mean that you can't think I'm under no obligation to do this, or that you can't mouth the words, I'm under no obligation to do this, but that moral obligation can't be denied outright and can't be denied undividedly. You can't be certain that what's morally wrong is in fact right because, and this is where we would have to talk about conscience, uh, conscience will always interfere. Um, I've said uh, a fair bit about that um, elsewhere. So my main idea is that uh, conscience can do three things. It's the basic task of conscience to apply abstract laws to the self. So without conscience, you would have uh, propositions like, it is impermissible to lie with conscience uh, because conscience makes it first personal. You have propositions like, I ought not to lie. Um, and conscience can do three things. Uh, conscience can say, uh, it's okay, go ahead. Uh, conscience can say, don't do it. And conscience can say, um, think harder. And I think this third think harder category, which is the category that's most explicitly at work in the inquisitor passage in the religion uh, is extremely important. Uh, so I think Kant's committed to the extremely optimistic enlightenment view that when right and wrong, not necessarily virtuous and less virtuous, that's a separate issue, uh, but when right and wrong are at issue, i.e. violations of strict or perfect or critical duties, depending on how you divide those up, uh, conscience will kick in. And uh, it, more often than not, uh, it will say, you can't be certain that uh, killing an innocent person, for example, in the case of the inquisitor is permissible, think harder. And as long as you can't um, get rid of those doubts, that I put on your plate, uh, you're not allowed to do it. Um, so I think uh, that's uh, the kind of um, lack of uh, deniability uh, that the fact of reason as a form of moral consciousness under a certain description uh, um, indicates. Next um, question, um, how do we encounter uh, the fact of reason? And um, Kant says in the passage quoted at the beginning, uh, consciousness of this fundamental law can be called a fact of reason. And the fundamental law in question is the Grundgesetz basic law of section seven, which is a version of the categorical imperative. That's just a few lines up in the Academy edition, bottom of page uh, 30, um, uh, right uh, after are the famous gallows cases. Uh, and it reads as follows, so act that the maxim of your will could always at the same time hold as a principle of a universal legislation. Now, uh, basic law Grundgesetz uh, is a difficult word and I change my mind, keep changing my mind about this about every other minute um, because I'm not entirely sure what it means. There are three options. Uh, there is, uh, as is uh, obvious to uh, people who read uh, the text in the original, uh, the sense uh, that's constitutional, because even in the late 18th century, uh, constitutional arrangements, for example, in the Holy Roman Empire, uh, were called Grundgesetz, Grundgesetze. Uh, there's also a scientific sense in which the most basic laws of, of physics uh, um, are Grundgesetze, or maybe of arithmetic uh, for that matter. And there's also a neutral sense in which it's just a basic or fundamental law. Um, it would make sense to say that it's constitutional because of um, the metaphor of legislation. But it also makes sense to say that it's the scientific sense because uh, Kant uh, returns to this theme in the typic. And in the typic, uh, what's at issue uh, is a fundamental law of nature. It's very close in spirit to the first variant formulation of the categorical imperative in the groundwork. So maybe we should say, well, it's neither really the one nor the other, more clearly the one or the other, uh, but rather it's a neutral sense. It's just the most fundamental um, law uh, of um, practical reason. 
and it takes on this or that shape or this or that nuance in this or that context. But I'm not entirely sure yet. And I, I half suspect we won't be able to settle that question uh, with any kind of um, certainty. Now, um, it's unlikely, it's implausible to say that we encounter this law in the abstract. I don't think he thinks, because you know, he was after all the first philosopher to formulate a principle with precision, that we encounter this law in the abstract when we deliberate morally. Um, rather, I think, because again, uh, returning to some of the topics we discussed um, after Martin's talk yesterday, uh, we encounter it in the guise of concrete first order categorical imperatives in morally relevant situations. So the way that we do universalization is uh, for ordinary non-philosophical moral agents who may be better at it than philosophers is kind of implicit. We do it in the sort of way that uh, if we're good at maths, uh, we um, you know, do sums or uh, maybe in the sort of way that um, uh, native speakers or you know, competent speakers of a language can distinguish, distinguish well-formed from informed sentences. Uh, and then uh, what we get in moral consciousness uh, is uh, something along the lines of, uh, I'm not allowed uh, to lie in court when uh, a prince uh, tries to bully me uh, into doing it because he wants to get rid of his wife. Um, so it's a first order imperative um, uh, in which, of course, the abstract principle, the basic law, fundamental law, is at work or is implicit. When do we encounter the fact of reason? Uh, again, close in spirit to what Kate and Martin uh, were talking about. And I think there the answer is fairly clear. Um, we encounter uh, the fact of reason in the sense of um, you know, first order moral judgment um, in which the basic law is um, implicit. Uh, when we um, deliberate prudentially, which comes first because inclinations have the first word, and when a prudential de deliberation delivers uh, some results. So um, the results being maxims um, um, who are deemed to be in all likelihood in our own interest. And that's the way that um, the examples in the Guan work uh, work, uh, take the example of the false promise. Uh, the um, case there is uh, somebody's in a tight spot and starts to think um, about, uh, you know, how to get out of the tight spot. And at some point, uh, the thought occurs to him that uh, a false promise might do the trick. And then Kant says he has conscience enough to ask himself whether dot, dot, dot. Right. So there are two stages. The first stage is um, prudential. And the second stage, um, at some point, um, pure reason kicks in, detaches deliberation from empirical conditions, and will um, urge, as Kant says in the initial passage, uh, the agent uh, to judge uh, morally. And this is in line with what he says um, about this uh, in the same kind of context, uh, just above the gallows example. Uh, in um, the second critique, uh, still actually in the context of what comes first, moral consciousness or freedom. Uh, so he says, that's a quotation at the top of the page. It's therefore the moral law of which we become immediately conscious. And then he says, as soon as we draw up or devise or design maxims of the will for ourselves, that first offers itself to us and in as much as reason presents it as a determining ground, not to be outweighed by any sensuous conditions and indeed quite independent of this leads directly to the concept of freedom. But how is consciousness of that moral law possible? And then uh, we launch into, um, after a few lines, uh, the gallows case. And of course the gallows case, the second gallows case ends on the note of, I'm conscious of, I'm conscious of the necessity of this, therefore, uh, I am free um, to do it. Final slide um, of the regular slides. Um, who encounters the fact of reason? And what we've just seen uh, suggests a pretty clear cut answer. Uh, so I don't think there's any reason, any basis in Kant's ethics to exclude anybody 
of a different race or a different sex uh, from moral judgment and moral agency, because he says that uh, it's basically anybody who can think straight about their own well-being, uh, presumably in a minimally sustained fashion. Right, so this is where our dear friend um, from Groundwork 3 mentioned yesterday as well, uh, comes in useful, Kant says, there is no one, not even the most hardened scoundrel. And then this is the crucial um, caveat. If only he's otherwise in the habit of using reason, who dot 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 does not wish that he too might be so disposed. He too might be a good person. So everybody deep down inside, if put in the right epistemic conditions, wants to be a good person. We all want to be good. It's just that scoundrels, and maybe most of us uh, as well, have strong inclinations that make it extremely difficult uh, to become uh, better people, not impossible, but extremely difficult in some cases. So you have to be able to use reason uh, in a means ends prudential kind of way. And if you do that in a sustained way, where exactly the lines to be drawn, I think is unclear. Um, at some point, uh, willy nilly, without your doing, the moral law will speak up. Uh, and this is just a fact about the kind of being we are. Um, I don't think there's an argumentative step, um, as some people think, from um, thinking potentially, deliberating potentially, to judging morally. I don't think that's possible because of the sharp divide that you get with autonomy between heteronomy and autonomy. You can't make that kind of step that Korsgaard makes from I can act, um, I can be motivated uh, prudentially or instrumentally to uh, um, pure practical reason uh, is in charge. Uh, that's something that Kant tried in the canon of the first critique, but he came to reject it later. So let me finish on the note of even more questions about the fact of reason. And I just mentioned very briefly and maybe indicate uh, possible answers, uh, but I won't discuss them uh, in any detail. Uh, what kind of genitive is it? Uh, right, the fact of reason. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, second uh, additional question, uh, does the full designation fact of pure reason, Kant says it's the sole fact of pure reason, indicate that there might be other facts of reason? Um, and there's a passage in the first critique where Kant talks about facts of reason, facta, in the plural, uh, in the doctrine of method. So at least he's using the word uh, fact of reason, or used the word in 81 or sometime uh, before 81 uh, in a different sense. Um, it's historical facts uh, in that case. So you might say, well, you know, practical reason can, uh, by us doing stuff, create facts of reason in the world uh, in a very different sense. Or you might say, for example, that in conjunction with uh, pure intuition, uh, geometry um, is a fact of reason, if not a fact of pure reason, because intuition is involved uh, as well. This is speculative, but I think it's interesting to see that uh, the fact of reason, as we normally call it, um, it's being the sole fact of pure reason may um, leave some room for uh, other facts of reason in a roundabout way. Uh, does the fact of reason occur in the groundwork, uh, not under that description, uh, not uh, fulfilling that function? And that's because I think it's crystal clear that Kant changed his mind about the third section. Um, uh, the third section wasn't rejected outright. There's lots of stuff that he retains in the second critique, but there's one bit about the third section um, he did uh, uh, reject, and that is the idea that um, the ideas, as he says, put us in um, the uh, realm of an intelligible world and that on the basis of this, we're justified in assuming that we are free. Um, again, I'm happy to say more during uh, the discussion. And last question, why did Kant introduce the doctrine of the fact of reason in 1787-78? Uh, well, it's implicit, the answer in what I've said already, uh, because the groundwork um, deduction doesn't work because there's a reversal. Um, now, a moral consciousness uh, is primary and freedom is deduced on the basis of moral consciousness, but really because he wants to say um, there's no way 
that moral consciousness can be established in any other way. Uh, it's just a given, it's just a brute fact in consciousness. Uh, and we can use it as the basis of deducing other stuff, but there's no deduction that can be given um, of moral consciousness. Um, that's it, half an hour, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thanks, uh, Jens, very much. Um, so the floor is open for questions. Um, first up is Thomas. Thank you, Jens. That was a wonderful list of questions that one can raise. I like that systematicity that you presented there. I wanted to go directly because uh, I was thinking about this Why before you were coming to the last slide where you have that question. Um, the question, what kind of genitive there is. Yes. Yeah, because that's an important one. Yeah. Uh, one can raise the same question, uh, whether it's a genitive or, uh, how do you pronounce that in English? Genitive or subjective? Well, you could say subjective or objective genitive. Yeah. Okay, subjective or objective uh, genitive. Uh, you can raise the same question with respect to Kant's expression, the interest of reason, for instance. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever there's a genitive, I think we can ask. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. And exactly. And it has to do with the fact that he tends, that his language tends to invite reifications of reason, uh, where one thinks of reason having interests and purposes and doing something and so on and so forth, instead of it being just the faculty by which we human beings are capable of doing certain things, namely doing, uh, using reason in a certain way, and Kant has this multitude of uses of reason, uh, that is each, each of these uh, uh, activities might be described as a kind of reason. Uh, in the case of interest of reason, my inclination is to say that it is a uh, subjective genitive, which one could then reduce yeah. by saying like it's a it's a it's a um, the interest of reason is a is an interest that is characterized by the rationality of that interest. So it is a rational interest rather than an interest that the object of which is then reason. Yeah? Yes. Yes. And the question is whether we can do the same with uh, the fact of reason. Yeah. You know? uh, the fact that factum is a Latin expression, I just looked it up also in Adelung, uh, and it yeah. doesn't occur there except for under the different kinds of headings of Tatsache, Tathandlung. Exactly. And a couple of others. Was, there were, those were the neologisms at the time. Exactly. When you, when you yeah, it, I mean, it may be given Kant's Latin background that, that there is something on his mind about this. Um, so if you if you think about amor patris in Latin, yeah, yes. that could be the love of the father or the love towards the father. Precisely. Exactly. Yeah. And the question is how that could rationally work in the case of the genitive of this objective genitive. I, I can make no proper sense of that. Uh, um, I can yes. make a proper sense of the uh, subjective genitive. It, it's a yeah. it's a fact of reason, a rational fact as opposed to an empirical fact. Yeah. I, I entirely agree. I think yeah. uh, if, if we have to choose between objective and subjective, it's clearly the subjective one. Mm -hmm. And that's in line with, you know, proving things um, through action. Uh, mm -hmm. So it would be uh, reason creating. Um, and there the Latin is lurking in the background. Uh, reason creating a fact. Um, um, but the problem is that we have more options than just the subjective and the objective. But there's also something like the possessive. Right. And maybe that's not altogether uh, uh, in inadequate either. It's the fact that belongs to pure reason, right? Or you get something like, I think it can, I, mean, I, I have to read all the grammar books about the yeah. various uh, uh, genitives and I've only just started uh, doing that. There's something like yeah. a constitutive genitive. Uh -huh. It's kind of the fact that is reason. Um, yeah. I, I think if we have to choose between objective and subjective, uh, the answer is clear. If you wheel in uh, the, uh, the scholarship of grammarians throughout the ages uh, and the long list of genitives on offer, it's much less clear. And then of course the question is, did he really think about this? Uh, you know, did he really get out his grammar book um, uh, uh, and uh, say, oh, you know, I pick this genitive for this purpose and that genitive for the other purpose. And I suspect the answer is no. Uh, so we have to say, these are the options. We can't decide between uh, various plausible um, versions of the genitive. Uh, there may be overtones of this in this passage and overtones of that in the other passage, but you're quite right. It certainly isn't the objective one. 
David, can I follow up on this just shortly? Yep, yep. go ahead. Yep. Uh, if it's the objective genitive, one might think that uh, the object, uh, it's a fact, the object of which is reason, a fact that characterizes reason in a certain kind of way. Yeah. Um, and then might be, for instance, it's, it's a fact that characterizes practical reason, that characterizes the faculty of reason in a certain kind of way. Maybe that it is sort of, uh, maybe the constitutive would, would work better, constituted by right. the consciousness of, of the moral law. The subjective genitive is grammatically better, but it seems to me it forces one towards the idea of Tathandlung, because then reason maybe. is the subject or the agent yeah. of that fact. Yeah. Grammatically, um, yes, but theoretically, no. <laughs> I think the, the problem with the objective um, genitive is just that it must be, it must have been obvious to Kant. And he didn't use the word Tatsache, right? He could have done uh, because it was available. He uses it elsewhere. But uh, factum, factum is just that which um, has been done. Right, so if you have the objective genitive, uh, reason is something that would have been produced. Uh, and if you're a sort of radical uh, a constructivist, maybe you're happy with that. Uh, uh, but I don't think it quite fits. Um, but I, I have, I'm open-minded about this. I haven't made up my mind yet. Uh, so I'm happy to entertain all manner of options. I mean, grammar helps only so much, but it helps a little bit to think better. Yeah. About these things. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, Martin. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, lots of good stuff. Um, so let me ask a question about the, the plausibility of it all. Um, in, in, I guess in, in two, or two, two, two questions about this, if, if I may. So one is, I think, whether or not the fact is robust or universal. I think with that question, it's extremely important what the content of the fact is. Yes. And I, I think there's a question in hand. If you get gallows, the content could be very thin, right? And interestingly, the gallows doesn't say anything about consequences. Right, we, it's under described, just don't know which, yeah. which way this um, would suggest that we act, right? So even a consequentialist could buy into the, the gallows case. Um, but then when, somewhere else, and you quote that passage, Kant say, says the fact is a consciousness of this fundamental law of reason or something, and it seems to be the categorical imperative. Yeah. Yeah. If that were the case, yeah. then I, I think it's much less plausible that everyone has a consciousness of this, um, of this fact, right? Because it, it would mean that everyone is a little Kantian. Whereas on the thinner reading, it would just mean that everyone acknowledges that if they think they ought to do something, they can they can do it and they should do it. Oh no, that, I that think he thinks, he thinks everybody's Kantian. I think there's no doubt about that. Uh, that's okay, why it's but, so fine to govern Epicurus. Um, yeah, yeah, but, but uh, I think just in terms of plausibility, it would be much better to detach the fact of reason from this, um, be, just because it's not the case that everyone is Kantian, right? Um, yeah. so question is concerning your introspective approach, right? Yeah. Where you think yeah. you, you should elicit the fact of reason introspectively. I think what's yeah. really important to really realize that recently is if Pistorius really thinks that some people might have the fact of reason and yeah. others don't, then yeah. I, I think it, 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 so even if Kant assumes that, you know, even Pistorius acknowledges the fact of reason, Pistorius could say, yes, okay, maybe I do, but I think many people don't, right? So even get me to acknowledge the fact of reason well, question whether well, it, it universalizes I, I think I think you're right I mean yeah yes um, there two things the first thing is uh, as you know uh, as you know very well uh, I'm somebody who wants to, to, to uh, uh, distinguish very sharply uh, interpretation or reconstruction from moral philosophy proper we need to do both uh, but they're not the same thing. And if you think they're the same thing, you just end up with a lot of wishful thinking. Uh, and that's extremely common uh, in, in Kant, in Kantian ethics uh, broadly construed. So I much rather ascribe to Kant, if there's no other way of doing it, uh, an implausible um, thesis, and then say, well, what do we do with this? Uh, how can we save bits and pieces of it? Uh, the second thing is, uh, as I said, I don't think he thinks that you can't be of the opinion that something is obligatory that is in fact um, impermissible um, or vice versa. What he thinks is that you can't be um, persuaded 
in a straightforward, undivided, clear-cut, certain sort of way. And then the question is, how do you judge people's other people's? Because I'm sure, Martin, you and I, you know, we feel the fact of reason, right? So what are we to make of people who say they don't feel it? This is not an empirical question. This is a question of whether we want to accord moral status to other human beings or not. And Kant would say, I suppose, are on the safe side. That you have no evidence. Uh, if in doubt, think that people are Kantian because it's only on that condition that we can treat them as ends in themselves. Um, that's, again, not a very strong argument. You may have doubts about it from a philosophical point of view, but I think it's very important to see that you can't settle that question. If you make it that kind of confined, you can't settle the question really empirically. Okay, Peter is next up. Thank you. So sure, there are uh, differences between questions of interpretation and other kinds of questions one might raise, though they are not completely independent. So I like your last two questions in particular, but I would like to add, if I may, um, a more external question about Kant. So uh, internal questions would be questions of the form. Uh, did he say, ask this question, these things before? What, what, what did he think about this and that that made him uh, change uh, to that view? Whereas the question I would like to raise is what, what kind of work can the fact of reason or his claim about the fact of reason play for his theory? And the reason why I find this question interesting is mm -hmm. that I've found the fact of reason weird for a long time because, you know, the conscious, consciousness of the moral law doesn't come with any credentials. Right. It's, there's a weird kind of foundationalism here. It's almost it's almost Thomas Reed, right? Mm -hmm. This is <laughs> polemically one could say he talks like someone who's uh, referring to the principles of common sense here. So and that's certainly not <laughs> something Kant would have liked to to accept. So. So one question is why did why did he do also an open question here at the end why why did he what did he think what made him introduce that but also uh, is it of any use to him and I have no clue what kind of use it could be it can't it can't do any argumentative work it seems and what I'm missing uh, in the in, in in the second critique is this lovely passage in the groundwork 402, where he kind of very quickly does conceptual analysis, deduces the categorical imperative, one of its formulations, yeah. from the notion of a goodwill and from the notion of duties. So again, the question is simply, what can it do for him? Thank you. Thanks very much. Um... Well, I, I, I must admit that in a sense, I'm not a huge fan of um, uh, the fact of reason either. I think in terms of its use, we really have to distinguish between uh, the fact of reason in the, in the technical sense that I've been trying to uh, present uh, and um, a robust notion of moral consciousness. And I'm no longer equating the two. Um, uh, so in the technical sense, it's, the thing that's given and that you can't um, prop up by means of further argumentation. Of course, um, you know, this is a point of departure from uh, the groundwork. And I'm really having to, if I had to choose between the two projects, uh, I'm very much a groundwork person because I, I think that kind, the kind of skepticism that Kant discusses in uh, the second section in particular, that sort of feeds into the third section, uh, namely, okay, let's grant that everybody uh, would like to be a good person, which of course is a huge thing to grant in the first place, uh, but uh, there's no evidence of the validity of the moral law uh, in experience or anywhere else for that matter, right? So the question is, uh, can the project still fail? Uh, even though we spelt out um, the categorical imperative as an expression 
of uh, moral, co uh, moral consciousness, uh, page 402, uh, as you say, this might just be illusory, this might be a chimera, this might just be a nice idea. Uh, and then he says in the third section, there is some independent evidence. And that seems to me, given that the challenge, um, uh, and we're philosophers, as you say, right? We want to dig deeper. As the challenge seems to make such good sense, I would like there to be a good deduction of the moral law um, along the lines of Groundwork 3. Uh, then we have to discuss um, why he came to think that it didn't work. Um, so I think that's the technical side. Uh, there are those two um, versions of Immanuel Kant. There's the 1784-5 version and the 1787-8 uh, version. And I think temperamentally, for the reasons you mentioned, uh, most of us uh, would be on the side of uh, the earlier Kant and not um, the later Kant. Um, I think the only thing that's to be said in defense of the later Kant is to say, well, you know, uh, when we argue, as we all know, uh, we all have to stop somewhere. Um, and uh, maybe, you know, if, 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 if we can grant something like uh, consciousness of an unconditional um, moral law or imperative somewhere. And of course, this is always lurking in the background. We grant all the stuff that's in the first critique about uh, idealism and uh, the, the split between the two uh, worlds or what have you, right? So it's been shown uh, uh, that freedom uh, is not um, at least uh, impossible. Um, then uh, why not trust uh, moral consciousness, uh, even in the face of um, the skeptics, uh, the empiricists uh, that uh, are so prominent uh, in, um, in uh, the groundwork. I think the answer is though that he's no longer prepared to face that kind of skepticism and that may well be a weakness. Um, systematically not using the word fact, I think my answer would be along the lines uh, um, of uh, what I said in reply to Martin's question. Uh, if we think that Kantian ethics is sort of not perfect, but the best version of an ethical theory out there, uh, according moral status to other people, depends on ascribing moral consciousness to them. And then I'd rather err on the side of saying, uh, this going back to the Enlightenment essay, of course, as well, I'd rather err on the side of saying they have doubts about it, um, and they could uh, arrive at the right conclusion, than say, you are a benighted little people, and I have to teach you what's morally good and bad. Does that uh, make Andrea. sense, Peter? Thank you. Andrea. Yeah, so um, so thank you, Jens. I, I think I, I, I agree a lot with what you said, except one thing that, um, but that is maybe only a, um, we might even share <laughs> our um, thoughts about that too. I, I, I'm a bit hesitant to think of the, the fact of reason um talk as a as a doctrine it seems more to me a, a an almost trivial reminder mm -hmm. of what we are talking about so to say and i i i, I want to uh, uh explain this a little bit and i think this goes um back or takes up something that thomas said at the beginning um trying to strip off some of the weirdness of Kant's reason talk by saying so this tendency to objectify reason and um, so so he could just say why so we use reason uh, to do this or think that yeah. and that and and I um um I think that one must um take seriously that it's um that it's reason <laughs> that uh that Kant talks about so um mm -hmm. it's if acts of reason are those acts that um are accompanied by the i think mm -hmm. such that none of these it's it's in virtue of being acts of reasons that we understand there to be acts that <laughs> can be expressed by saying I think such and such. Um, then it is difficult to to say well it's 
he, we should just say that it's there is an eye that employs reason because it is in terms of the very idea of reason that we are supposed to understand yeah. that there is so much as an eye <laughs> that can think um, this or that. So um, I um, so, so at, at end and for example and have ends. So it's in terms of. Re practical reason that we understand what it is to have so much as an end or what it is to um, set ends for oneself that uh, we can then um, but only derivatively understand what it means to say well it's it's me the human being uh, who who has this or that end now goes uh, cooking or whatever what it means to have an cool. end um, so it's through reason talk that Kant thinks to make sense of that talk that Thomas suggested to be less weird. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, so I just wanted to say why, why. So, okay, so, but this brings me back to, to why I think that the fact of reason talk has some, uh, it's, it's, it's more than, it's less a doctrine, but a trivial reminder. Um, because it's, it's so, um, because in one sense, I mean, so the 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 the, the, the double meaning, um, the subjective and the objective meaning, I mean, in one sense, this difficulty reflects um, the difficulty that we um, have whenever we have a capacity act structure. So what mm -hmm. is it to, um, uh, to establish the existence of a capacity? Well, you establish the existence of a capacity by, um, uh, by uh, establishing the existence of its actualization. And well, but what enables me to, to say that actually the cat is breathing um, well because uh, she has the capacity to breathe that she actualizes. So it's mm -hmm. just, I mean, so so you 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 is the it's it's just a, the intrinsic relation between capacity act. You cannot uh, establish the existence of the capacity independently of the act, but you cannot identify the act and um, and establish its extens existence independently of the capacity. So this is true, so to say of whatever capacity of living beings you uh, you are talking about. But now we are talking once again about this, this special capacity, the capacity um, that um, the self-conscious capacity. And here, so to say, what, what Kant is saying is that in the in the case of the um, the cat, of course I, I can derive the existence of the capacity to breathe of the cat because I do have a teleological system of capacities that mm -hmm. need to be possessed by a cat or even by any animal. Um, and so I can think, okay, she has, a, so she breathes and she desires and, 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 they, and every capacity is for the sake of any other capacity. So we might think I can refer to something outside the capacity to breathe. So it's not just that I have, the only thing I have is her breathing, but there are other capacities to which I can refer prior data, so to say, um, um, to to um, to um, to infer or to 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 argue why why um, why she's also a breather, <laughs> right? Um, because why? Well, because she's a she's a cat, and as a cat, so, so. none of this kind of. Um, uh, um, Nothing of that I can refer to when when I talk about reason. And and mm -hmm. there is no such thing <laughs> to which I uh, from which I could uh, 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 infer or so there is no notion of whatever it is, <laughs> because the notion of a human being is not the kind of thing to which I can refer in order to say, well, because it's a human being. So among others, there will be reason in yeah. her. No, because yeah. we human being is defined in terms of and so forth so so that's why i'm just saying so it's 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 a trivial reminder to 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 say that reason cannot be um deduced from anything prior to it because it is the very capacity that is identical with the consciousness of it yes i mean i i think reminder is a is probably a good word um and I did hesitate to use the word doctrine. Uh, I thought maybe I should use thesis or tenet, which is slightly weaker uh, than, than doctrine and maybe more compatible with um, 
it's just being a reminder. I, I decided to use the word doctrine in the end because of the architectonic role that I think the fact of reason plays in the first chapter. Uh, but I don't want to disagree with um, sort of phenomenologically uh, uh, the way that uh, the fact of reason uh, enters the scene. Uh, and uh, of course, once we start discussing things in those terms, uh, we stretch language quite a bit in the way you've uh, uh, set out. Um, so um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with that. Mm -hmm.